This morning, we begin a new series. We are going to do a, uh, a series on end times. Now, let me just say up front, today is, uh, it'll be an introduction. Um, you know how sometimes my messages are, are very boring? Um, uh, this may be one of them this morning, so I apologize that if it feels just a little bit you know, like I'm bouncing around the place a little bit. I'm trying to set things up, because uh, talking about end times is a little bit tricky, because there's a lot to wade through. And so I wanted to take this morning, by way of introduction, just to try and frame everyone's thinking and set the scene a little bit. Uh, when we talk about the, the biblical concept of uh, end times, it most often goes by the name Bible prophecy. Uh, in the area of systematic theology, uh, it is called uh, eschatology. So whether I'm referring, it, referring to it as end times or Bible prophecy or eschatology, I'm talking about the same thing. And I tend to bounce around those terms a little bit. So just up front, just kind of be aware that those are synonymous terms uh, they're technically maybe not 100% synonymous. You could, uh, there's some subtlety between them, but for what we're going through over the next few weeks to a few months, whatever it ends up being, those are, um, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. So let's, let's start by reading 2 Peter. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me. 2 Peter chapter 3, I believe it is. Yeah, it is, chapter 3. And I'm just going to read to you the first four verses. I think this is a good way to um, set the scene a little bit or just kind of take your mind to a specific place. Here we go. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as, as they were from the beginning of creation. That's a, that's a good verse to kind of sum up a lot of people's mindset and attitude to prophecy. And I love that Peter took the time in 2 Peter to say, look, I'm telling you for the second time here, um, stay diligent, stay faithful, waiting for the coming of Christ. Those things that the prophets have spoken of. He even identifies and acknowledges that people say, where's, the, where's your Christ? Because you've been waiting for him, but everything seems exactly the same as how it always was. And we're being reminded here by Peter to keep, to keep that anticipation and to wait patiently for the return of Christ. So when I say prophecy, um, when I introduce that topic, what, what comes to mind? We are all imagining something a little bit different. For some of you, you went straight to the rapture, right? Prophecy, the rapture. For other people, you started thinking about the mark of the beast. That started kind of hovering around in your mind. We all have you know, a, a different experience and different exposure to this concept of Bible prophecy. Uh, do you remember the Left Behind series in the mid-90s? Whew, that put the fear of God in you, didn't it? Uh, and I remember the song I used to love by Crystal Lewis. Remember? People get ready. Jesus is coming. Oh, I had my Christian radio turned up, driving, singing my heart out on that one. I feel very alone with that. You guys are all looking at me like, which song were you singing? Okay. But the, we all have different uh, convictions and a different attitude towards this topic of Bible prophecy. Uh, many Christians shy away from it. Some even just boycott it completely. For others, they, uh, it generates a lot of excitement. They are just pumped by the topic of end times. So before we get into some of the details, I'm going to take a moment 
Um, Because I want to discuss the problem with prophecy and some of the baggage that comes with prophecy. So the problem with prophecy, it's, it's it's a discipline of church study that has fallen on hard times. Uh, For many, there is a stigma uh, attached to it, and so there is some baggage that we kind of need to wade through and acknowledge. Uh, Even for myself, for many years of my faith, I just put eschatology in the too hard basket. Just kind of put it over there, I'll kind of leave it for the enthusiasts to wrangle with its complexity, and I'll just kind of focus on other things. And, you know, I think we all probably know that person that is just way too into prophecy. They're just amped. You know, they've got rapture t-shirts and stuff. (laughs) And in every conversation, they're trying to insert their prophecy agenda. They're just chomping at the bit to say something about prophecy. And so this is kind of the range of Christians. And uh, I think it's, uh, we all could mature and have a, very specific temperament to how we're going to approach Bible prophecy. And as much as I love the excitement that those people have, you know, Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other, you know, kind of like, ah, yes, it's happening. I love that. It's a great excitement. But there is a bit of sober-mindedness that we need to introduce to that. Now, I am empathetic to all the confusion and the cynicism that exist that accompanies Bible prophecy. Throughout the years, Christians have gone on record making a lot of big claims about Bible prophecy. In particular, the rapture. Remember Harold Camping? He went on record, didn't he? Not once, but twice. That was the rapture was going to happen back in, first of all, 1994. Then he reran the numbers when it didn't happen, and it was 2011, and of course, here we all still are. In fact, in the past few months, uh, there's a numerologist called, I think his name's David Mead. He has proposed April 23rd for the rapture. That's 12 days, folks. (laughs) So, and again, I I love the passion, (laughs) but Matthew... uh, 24, I think it is, uh, reminds us that no man knows the day or the hour. So uh, there is much discussion surrounding the, the timing and the nature of Bible prophecy. And you know what's a little bit disheartening is theologians are divided on it. So it's a little bit of a bummer when the people that we look to to guide and influence us are at odds with one another. That can kind of just kind of suck the energy out of your efforts because you think, well, if they can't figure it out, what, what, am, what am I expecting to come up with? And so that can kind of demotivate our engagement on prophecy. Uh, I would say most other areas, I think this is almost true, uh, most other areas of Bible theology and doctrines, there is a majority view. Uh, there is kind of an orthodox view that people will hold to. Uh, but with eschatology, that, that is, actually isn't the case. There's a wide range of perspectives and flavors on eschatology. In fact, it might be fair to say that the evangelical church disagree on more than they agree upon. So this is the series we're entering into, and I don't know what makes me think I'm going to unpack this better for you, but I'm going to have a go at it still. So we'll see, if I, we'll see how long I go on this series. It should be fun. Uh, One of the criticisms of Bible prophecy, and I will, I understand this criticism, and I think a lot of us think this consciously or subconsciously, is that prophetic events seem implausible. To be honest, they're kind of outrageous claims. When we look at what's going to happen, they're a little bit kind of like, okay, really? They're quite preposterous, really, when you think about it. For example, the rapture. That's a fascinating concept when you're, if you're honest with yourself and think about it, that we're going to be caught up. You know, what are we all imagining with that? Everybody's thinking they're going to hear the trumpet, the last trumpet, and they're just going to kind of just launch yourself up, and, and we go up, and we're caught up to Jesus. 
We don't know what to think with a lot of this stuff. We don't know how to animate it in our mind. And as a result of that, it just all seems a little bit kind of um, whimsical or something. And that, can, again, can really demotivate uh, a lot of people's engagement with it. But here's the thing. It is, it is uh, outrageous. It does transcend man's control and man's imagination. It does. That's the nature of it. It is of a cosmic scale. It is the supernatural world colliding with the natural world. It is outrageous. That's the nature of it. So I, on one hand, I acknowledge that it's, there's some out there statements and prophecies that are being made, but that's the nature of it. And I think that's absolutely okay. But when you think about it, when you look back through God's interventions throughout history, a lot of them are outrageous. Do you remember when God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through, through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Is that, that's kind of outrageous. That's the, the nature of it, is the events. When God comes down according to his timeline and he intervenes, it is a little bit implausible conceptually, but it does not make it any less true. Just because it exceeds what we conceive, it doesn't mean that it isn't going to play out exactly like he says it's going to play out. So I acknowledge that it does have some fanciful uh, aspects to it, but we can rest assured that God means every word that he has said regarding end times. Now, I also will say uh, that there is a lot of uh, symbolism and uh, metaphors used with end times. And again, that's fine as well. It, that doesn't make the events any less literal. It just means the metaphor and what it represents are literal concepts. So don't mistake metaphor for allegory. Then these are not, when it comes to eschatology, there are no allegories. They are, there is metaphor and there is symbolism, but they are all pointing to literal things. Again, not everybody believes that, so I am going on record saying we're entering into the study of end times acknowledging the literal plan that God has in store. And, uh, and when you think about it, just to kind of give a little slight defense for the uh, symbolism and the metaphors used, the, uh, John, the apostle, he's on the island Patmos. I think that's in the Aegean Sea, isn't it? Yes, it is. And he's been exiled there, and he has a vision, and, or he turns around and there he sees the risen Christ. And the Lord shows him the things to come. Now, John, of course he's going to be using metaphor. Of course he's going to be using symbolism. Why? Because God is showing him a, a, a civilization and technology and the things thousands of years ahead. He's seeing that. You too would be using a lot of metaphor and imagery to try and describe what he's seeing. And so that's kind of the nature of what we see in the book of Revelation. Uh, just a quick side note here, and I want to make minimal side notes because I do want to try and get through this uh, within an hour and a half. Um, or two hours? All right, good. Um, one of the temptations that people have when it comes to um, Bible is when we are faced with something that has a strong theological tension and it's hard to harmonize with the way we're thinking, and we don't know how to understand and imagine it, the temptation is to not take stuff literally. Uh, for example, you've all heard the philosophical question and the thought, why does God make babies or people or souls that he knows are not going to choose him and go to hell? Why does he do that? Who agrees that that's a difficult question to think about, right? Right? Well, and I acknowledge that as well. And yes, there's some good apologetic philosophical reasons for that that I'm not going to get into, but here's what people do. They take that, that, that problem and they change one attribute about God to fix all the problems connected to it. 
So all you have to do is say, well, God can't see the future. That's called open theism, by the way. That's a theological position. Now look what that did, though. We changed one attribute about God, and we, saved hundreds, we just solved hundreds of problems. You can resolve a thousand problems by changing one attribute about God. And that's the temptation in biblical interpretation. As they identify these theological problems and they try to change a nature, something about God, to resolve that. And we must resist that temptation. That is a grand assault on the nature of God and his word. And eschatology is one of those studies where that is a huge temptation is to look at it and think, well, that can't be, so it must mean this. And as soon as you start doing that, you are going to have a very ineffective journey studying end times. Okay, why does Bible prophecy matter? Why does Bible prophecy matter? What's the value in focusing our attention on prophecy? I mean, if it's going to happen whether we like it or not, why would we you know, worry about it? Because in, in, if something's inevitable, that just promotes apathy a little bit in us. Why concern ourselves with things that's going to happen, whether we like it or not? Uh, I think this has been a big reason why Christians have deprioritized. Deprioritized? Is that a word? <laughs> Unprioritized? Antiprioritized. <laughs> doesn't matter. We'll figure this out later. There's someone right now Googling it, thinking, wow, this guy's an idiot. Um, why, why haven't we made it a priority? And a lot of the reasons, one of the main reasons, is because it's not a salvation issue, right? Isn't that one of the big ones? I don't worry about that because it's not a salvation issue. You're right, it's not a salvation issue. But if the bar that you have set for yourself theologically are only things that are <laughs> salvation issues... You, are living, you have a very low bar in your journey with God because there are a tremendous amount of spiritual truths that we are meant to discover that are beyond salvation issues. Bible prophecy matters. The essential requirement, this, this I believe is a very important uh, requirement in order to receive biblical prophecy, is you have to have a right appreciation for God's sovereignty, and that he is just. I think if we understand those two things about God, that he is sovereign and that there is to be justice, then we enter into Bible prophecy profoundly aware that God needs to do a lot of what he lays out in Bible prophecy. One quarter of the Bible, one quarter of this book is about Bible prophecy. And so if we're not going to concern ourselves about Bible prophecy, then one quarter of the Bible, one quarter of things that God thought that we should know about, we have shown zero interest in. So that should motivate us to want to engage Bible prophecy. In Revelation chapter 1, we're introduced to this Really cool thing, a yeah, really great thought. It says, Revelation 1, verse 3, Blessed is the man who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. This is the only book in the Bible that offers you a special blessing for just being in that book. Revelation, blessed is the man. And, and the word blessed is best translated happy. Happy, blessed. If you read Revelation and you consume yourself with it, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be happy. Well, that's interesting. It sounds like we should probably make it a priority. So what is the special blessing that is afforded to the student of this epistle? Well, I'll share some thoughts. Uh, first of all, everyone, everyone appreciates a schedule. Everyone, we all do. If you've got an upcoming holiday uh, or an upcoming conference, you want to know the timetable. Everyone likes that, right? It helps us be ready, it helps us prepare, and it helps us to know what to expect. That's the beauty of prophecy. Now, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because God was, is faithful, was faithful in his word to give us a timetable, to give us the itinerary. 
And where it gets, where we get tripped up a little bit is it's hard to figure out some of the timing and know exactly what it's going to look like. So we can, there are some things that are explicit and obvious in Bible prophecy and some things that we have to labor over to unpack. And uh, I think that's the, the tension. You know, it's kind of like, we, everyone here uses GPS, right, to get from A to B. I, I, I don't even think I rem, you think about north, south, east, west anymore. That doesn't mean anything to me because I got some lady on my phone telling me where to go. <laughs> we rely on that GPS. But what doesn't happen with that GPS, and I think would be annoyed if it did, is it doesn't suddenly speak up and say, turn right on the off-ramp you just went past. <laughs> we don't have to deal with that, and, and we don't have to with Bible prophecy either. Why it matters is because it lays it all out, and you know what to expect, you know how to be prepared, you know how to interpret things. Let me just mention a few other reasons why it's good and why prophecy matters. It reminds us that God is sovereign in control. He is sovereign and he is in control. That's why us understanding Bible prophecy matters. Two, it gives us an understanding of his plan. He's actually, he's looped us in on his plan. Three, it gives us hope. It, it's, listen, this world is bonkers. It's crazy. There's just all sorts going on. We've got to keep our sanity in this. We can find some hope that it is all in control. It's all as per God's plan and schedule. It helps us understand the world around us. We're able to interpret this world. We're able to interpret current events. We're able to interpret the condition of the church. We're able to recognize what is going on because we understand the things that God has said are going to happen in those things. Uh, understanding Bible prophecy, it, and this is, I think this is a big one, it increases our faith in his word. God has given us so many prophecies that have come to fulfillment, we should have a whole lot of confidence. I mean, the, the prophecies regarding the first coming of Christ, they were spot on. Shouldn't we therefore be concerned about all the prophecies for a second coming? And then, of course, just a last thought here on that is Jesus wants us to be ready. That's why prophecy matters. He wants us to be informed. And that leads to my third point here this morning. Bible prophecy is actually meant to be understood. We are, we're, it's not meant to be abused. It's not, not meant to be confusing. We're actually meant to have clarity on Bible prophecy. Throughout Scripture... These are upwards of 1,500 prophecies. Uh, you can generally uh, break these prophecies up into uh, prophecies that concern the destruction of cities and nations that uh, persecuted Israel. There's uh, prophecies regarding that. There are prophecies regarding the first coming of Christ, and there are prophecies regarding the second coming of Christ. You could use those three pillars as kind of central categories for, uh, for prophecy, and we should be concerned about the things that he's spoken about in the future. Uh, because they give us or they reveal to us God's plan, his purpose, and the person of Christ. In the book of Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, this is how it starts off. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So why would God show us something that would actually confuse us? That's the myth with uh, eschatology is that, oh, it's confusing, it's quite jumbly, it's kind of, oh. we're actually meant to understand it. Why would he show us these things if it was not to be understood? You know what the word revelation means? The book of Revelation means unveiling. So we're actually meant to understand this, and, and we know God's not the author of confusion, God's desire is that we would understand these things. You, did you know there, there is an endless list of things that God has not looped you in on. Which means the things that he has told you about, you should probably, you know, uh, oh, okay. That means it's important to us. Amos 3, verse 7, uh, you can make a note of it in your notes here. It says, For the Lord God does nothing 
without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. Did you hear that? Let me read that again. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to the servants, the prophets. That is the nature of God. He wants to reveal the things to us. He wants us to know these things. Now, under the new covenant, we don't have prophets anymore, so God does, we got upgraded from prophets to the word of God. This is the prophetic word of God. This is, the word prophet or prophecy means to speak uh, God's word. And so this is what we have today. And so it is God's nature to tell us. We are meant to know. We are not meant to be confused on these things. So let me do a, uh, a little overview, a little end time overview here. And this will kind of give you a glimpse of where we're going over the next few weeks. Uh, to make sense of Bible prophecy, we have to consider uh, multiple texts from the Bible. Uh, you know, Revelation is obviously the most popular one, but we can't just reduce our investigation to Revelation. We have to interpret Scripture with Scripture. You, Bible prophecy is the composite of multiple texts. Uh, those texts are, just to give you a glimpse, this is not all of them, but this is the kind of primary sections. We've got the prophetic books in the Old Testament. Daniel, the book of Daniel, maybe being one of the, the most significant ones. Isaiah, of course, has so much to say about first and second coming. Uh, Ezekiel has a lot to say. Zechariah. So the prophets in the Old Testament, we need to understand those. We can't just look at Revelation without overlaying the words of the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, and then, of course, the words of Jesus, in particular, the Olivet Discourse. That was the conversation he had with his disciples on Mount of Olives. We call that the Olivet Discourse. And he speaks specifically about the things to come. So we need to, we need to understand the, the, the prophets. We need to understand the book of Revelation. We need to understand the words of Christ. Uh, those are, we need to kind of pull these together to paint the picture. And as we overlay these together the image of Bible prophecy comes into focus. Uh, of course, Jesus' parables, many of them were about end times. Now, this is something I just want to give mention to is for each of, for all of us, we all need to kind of enter into the study as best we can to throw off our presuppositions. It's difficult, right? Because our presuppositions are always right, which is great. <laughs> so we need to enter into this trying to just letting go of some things, letting go of our experience, our emotions, kind of whatever we've learned. Because the number one thing that's going to dramatically shape the trajectory of your end times is going to be your hermeneutics. Uh, that is your uh, method of interpretation. If you take an allegoric interpretation of the Bible versus the, a literal, you are going to end up in world, worlds apart on eschatology. And so we need to think about the, how we're going to regard Scripture and how we're going to interpret it. I think it's very important to be very literal when we interpret God's Word. Now, we know that we're in the last days. Um, I hesitate saying that because Paul, the Apostle Paul, he thought he was in the last days. Every generation believes we're in the last days, and that's because they are. Technically, you can say from the moment that Christ ascended to whenever he returns, that, that's the last days. But we've also all heard that term, the last of the last days, right? <laughs> and, a, and one day, some people are going to say, the last of the last of the last days, I'm sure. But I will say, I, we, I do believe that term, that we're on the last of the last days, that we are on the cusp of his return. Why? Because some pretty significant prophecies have been fulfilled in the past hundred years, that set the scene for the events to unfold. The veil on a lot of what, took, what Revelation speaks of and what a lot of the prophets speak of, a lot of these things have been fulfilled. Maybe none greater than the nation Israel being reestablished in 1948. That is a shocking fulfillment of prophecy. They hadn't existed for 2,000 years. And... Ezekiel tells us that they are going to come back as a nation in one day. It even prophesied that, and it's exactly what happened. 
And that needed to happen before the ball was getting rolling for those final events. So we actually do live in a very interesting time where some of the most significant biblical prophecies are being fulfilled before our eyes. And we'll talk more about some of the the current event side of this later on once we create a healthy foundation. So we are in the last days. Um, Now, uh, I'll I'll just, for the sake of clarity, just to make sure we understand something here about uh, how prophecy works when it comes to the timetable, there are two major categories with uh, two groups of the way Christians approach end times. And I wish I had a slide for this. I don't know why I didn't make one. One is called preterism. Preterism. Not preter. Uh, preter with P-R-E-T. Preterism. And futurism. These are your two major categories of eschatology. If we had to kind of go all the way back to that first bifurcation where we see two distinct paths, one is preterism, one is futurism. You just need to be aware of this. I don't know if you need to remember the terms, but preterism is the belief that all the events that are spelled out in the uh, book of Revelation have already happened, and they happened in the first century, including the rapture. They believe that it was a spiritual rapture. They believe the Antichrist uh, was back in the first century. So preterists do not look to the future for coming events. That's preterism. Futurists uh, fall into two categories. By the way, I'm a futurist, and likely most of you probably are futurists as well. But then futurists fall into two categories, and that's where this room will be divided. You've got people that believe that the church will be a part of the tribulation, and that that those are uh, post-trib, meaning the rapture is going to happen after the tribulation. And you've got those who believe the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. And then you have some futurists who do believe in the millennium, the thousand-year reign, and some that don't. Okay, so we'll get into some of those topics. But I identify those to say, first of all, preterism, we're not going to talk about that or kind of get into the weeds of that. We're futurists, and then you may or may not believe on pre-trib, post-trib rapture, or the millennium. And we'll get into that stuff a little bit later. I don't know if that confused you at all, what I just said. If it did, then that's not my fault. Okay. <laughs> Let me just show you a quick overview here of uh, Bible prophecy. Uh, look, I, on this list, I just mentioned 16 things here. Um, no particular order, but I kind of wanted to introduce these terms because you've heard of them. And uh, so you've got the rapture. I talked about the differences on, on that one there. We've got the tribulation. That's that seven-year uh, event. Uh, that's got a lot going on. You've got the second coming. Is that different than the rapture? Well, I guess it depends what you believe. The millennium, that's the thousand-year reign. The Antichrist, the beast, the little horn. 666. You can even buy some shoes from him now. You guys aware of that? For those people who aren't aware, you are very confused by that comment. You just go check the news. Uh, the mark of the beast, uh, everybody's interested in that one. You don't want to get the mark of the beast, right? Have you got it already? You know, what's the vaccine? The back of the mark of the beast? Whoa, that's a conversation. Uh, the great white throne judgment. The beamer seat judgment. Well, you may have not even heard that second one there. The seven bowls, the seven trumpets, the new Jerusalem. Uh, the kingdom of heaven. What does that even mean? Da- uh, Daniel's 70 weeks, uh, number 13 there. That's interesting. Of course, the book of Revelation is its own thing. The Olivet Discourse I, I, I mentioned. The lake of fire. There's a lot going on there. And depending on where you start with what you believe changes how you interpret most of that stuff. Uh, the lake of fire. Is that, how's that different than hell? Is it different than hell? What is Hades? What is Sheol? What is heaven? What is paradise? What is the new Jerusalem? Right? You know you're all unsure about all those things I just mentioned. Because you're not, you're not different than me. I've spent so much time conflating these terms. And this is why Bible prophecy, I think, is a little bit complex. Because you have to labor quite hard to get your head around it. Because you don't have the luxury of just reading one section of Scripture which explicitly comprehensively explains all this stuff. You have to interpret the scripture with scripture 
you have to kind of uh, correlate and, like I said, make a composite of, these, uh, of God's word to get that picture of what's going on. So over the next few weeks, I'm not going to cover all those things, by the way. I think I'll just kind of grab out the ones that I think are the most interesting and the ones where I think there's the most confusion around. And I think that'll be interesting. Will it be interesting? Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, my fourth point, my last point, most important point, is this. Prophecy is about Jesus Christ. Revelation 19.10. Again, this is John's vision. Listen to this. Then I fell down, this is John, I fell down at his feet to worship him, and this is an angel that we're talking about. This isn't Jesus. He fell down to worship an angel, which he had no business doing. <clears throat> but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Listen to this. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You may have heard that uh, little quip, history is his story. Have you ever heard that? You seen the bumper sticker, right? No, no one? Okay. History is his story. <laughs> is that mumbling away at me like uh, what I'm saying doesn't make sense? History is the story of redemption. The, from, the, from the very beginning, the theme of Scripture is the, the person of Christ. John 5, 39, Jesus says, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. God's, the, the Scriptures, God's Word, Old Testament, this is all about Christ. Did you know that Jesus is all through the Old Testament? What does it say in Genesis 1? God made man in our image. Plural, our image. Who's he talking about? The Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that the Word was at the beginning and the Word is Jesus. And so I think the foundation that I want to lay for this whole study is that the fullness of time, from Adam to the Antichrist, from the very beginning to the end, it is concerned with God's relationship with his creation. That's the thematic point of history and everything else. That is the point of prophecy. The first time Jesus came as a suffering servant, the second time he will come as a mighty warrior. He won't be docile. He won't be like a lamb being led to the slaughter. He is the lion of Judah. He will come ready to take back his creation. Everything throughout the Bible uh, is a story of God wanting to be reunited with his creation. I've heard some apolog criticism, people who are polemic about uh, the Bible say, oh, the Bible's not very scientific. Well, no, it's not a science book. It's, uh, it can be reconciled to science, and you see some wonderful scientific insights. It doesn't contradict science, and there's a, an apologetic defense for all that. But the, the book is not a full commentary on history. It's not a science book. It is God's written word regarding the redemption story. The mistake that Christians do and churches, what they do, is they pry out eschatology out of the redemption story and they make it its own thing. And they get all about it. You know, that's like the guy who goes to the gym and only does chest and arms and that's it. And he's all out of proportion and he's not that functional and he's actually not that useful and he's all skewed and distorted. That's what happens when you separate eschatology out from soteriology or uh, in times out of the redemption story of Christ. That's when it starts becoming whimsical. That's when we start mishandling it. That's when we start uh, making the whole thing bombastic and kind of fabulous and exciting and we start reading into things. Because we forgot this whole thing is about Christ. <clears throat> And the overriding 
and the most essential aspect of Bible prophecy is that Christ is coming soon. That's the point. There are people that are anticipating the Antichrist more than they're anticipating Christ. People have made, with prophecy, people have elevated it in a way that has brought some ill health to it. And so I share a lot of this with you this morning because I want to create a little bit of a foundation here so that as we enter into talking about these complex and kind of fanciful topics, that there's a sober-mindedness. And we need to remember this is all about God's redemptive plan. This is all about what Christ is doing. Uh, everything, in fact, what we might be better off doing is instead of using the rubric um, eschatology or end times, maybe we should just say God's plan. Because that, that's actually what it is. It's just God's plan. From the very beginning, what was the very first prophecy in, the, in Scripture? Genesis 3.15 is the very first prophecy. It says, I will, I will put, this is just after the fall, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is speaking of the crucifixion of Christ and the victory that Christ is going to have over Satan. And we can unpack that another time. The very first prophecy in the Bible is God saying, oh, I'm going to handle that. I'm going to handle the enemy, and I'm going to handle sin. It's going to be a redemption story. Here is my plan. That is why Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is just all the things that God has spoken of. Uh, all of history used to be a future thing. All of history used to be a prophecy. And so God has a plan. He has, and, he's, and he's given us the timetable. He's given us some insight. And he has said to us, it is important that you understand this. There's a special blessing. There's happiness to be enjoyed. Here are the very last words of Jesus. The very last words that he said in, sorry, the very last recorded words in the Bible uh, is in chapter 22. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So for the church age, for you and I, we should be just concerned about being ready for his return. That's the heart of prophecy. Uh, the worship team can come up. Prophecy, when we lean in on it and we start being concerned about it and interested it expands our horizon on spiritual things. Many Christians live in a two-dimensional space with spiritual things, and I'm telling you, one of the blessings that God promises with prophecy is it takes your, your two-dimensional plane you're on and makes it three-dimensional. It takes your black and white spiritual experience to technicolor. This is what prophecy is going to do. I mentioned earlier that God was sovereign and just, and this requires, in order for his justice and his sovereignty, this requires that he outwork his perfect plan and redeem a broken and fallen world. That's what this whole story is. And so we'll talk more about, um, I think next week, don't, I don't promise this because who knows what my study's going to, journey it's going to take me on this week, but I think next week we'll talk about the rapture, because I, I think that um, that brings a, depending on what we learn and understand about the rapture, will determine what we learn and understand about the tribulation. The tribulation will help us understand things like the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the two witnesses, the, the trumpets, the bowls, the scrolls, all these different aspects. So we kind of need to just go in some kind of systematic order so we know how to kind of plot things along the way. But it is going to be a really exciting study because I truly believe, and you can circle back with me in a couple of months and tell me if this is true, I believe that you are going to go on a really enriching 
journey where you see and understand things about the heart of God that you haven't seen in your Christian journey so far. It's going to be exciting. So church, let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for that your, uh, your written word, and in particular, that you told us things to come. God, may we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, understand these things deeply. May we uh, be ready as your bride. May the church be, may this church be ready. God, may we fixate our eyes on your imminent return. Uh, God, at Titus, it talks about the blessed hope of your return. And I think we do put our hope in you, and we trust that you are sovereign, you are in control, and with all the chaos and with all the everything that's going on in this crazy world, it is all not out of your control. Everything's playing out within your sovereignty and authority. And so we find some peace and hope in that. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.